All right, so we're here with the Gil Goodman today on Among the Stones. So, Gil, tell everybody about yourself, uh, those that don't know who you are. Well, um, I am a um, probably best known as a uh, grip sport enthusiast and athlete. I'm also the owner of Barrel Strength Systems, uh, which is a company that builds strength equipment primarily uh, catering towards grip strength. Um, I also do a bit of bending, rock climbing, um, and in my uh, for my day job, I do uh, mechanical engineering for an uh, oil and gas company. Okay, wow, that's that's a good occupational grip there, I'd imagine. You get uh, opportunities to use your grip there. Um, <clears throat> not so much. Yeah. I mean, I uh, do a little pinching on a computer mouse. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's uh, for the engineering sounds sounds real techy and science and, and stuff, but it's it's mainly just um, spreadsheets and conference calls and emails. Okay, I know some other engineers who mainly do wrenching, so I figured it was one way or another. Yeah. So we did have a few uh, fan questions coming for you. So I want to get those squared away first. So you cool. came from a bouldering and climbing background before you went into grip. When you first went into grip sport, did you notice any gaps that you had to fill? Any weaknesses from your coming from a bouldering background and getting into grip? We have a lot of guys in the Northwest that do climbing and Spartan events that want to get into grip sport and are interested in understanding that. Yeah, no, that's, um, I was actually talking to somebody about this yesterday. Um, so rock climbing and, and really almost, almost every sport that you would think is kind of grip related, um, is very heavily skewed towards support strength. So climbing up rocks, you know, you're mostly, your hand is in this position, your fingertips are on the hold and you're pulling, pulling yourself up. Um, if you're doing pull-ups, your hand is like this, your fingers are over a bar and you're pulling yourself up. If you're doing deadlifts, your hand is like this wrapped around the bar, but almost all the weight is on your fingers and you're pulling the bar up off the floor. So, um, bouldering is not too different in that regard in that, um, basically everybody that's got a bouldering or, or sport climbing background, um, has, uh, a significant, uh, pinching strength or thumb strength deficit. There are, there are um, you know, higher level climbers who will train their thumbs so they can uh, do pinch holds better. Um, but by and large, my experience coming from climbing, going into grip, it was, my thumbs were, were super weak. I could pick up the inch dumbbell the very first time I ever tried it. Um, but I struggled to pinch more than, I don't know, 75 80 pounds one-handed so and and you know i i eventually got to where i could pinch a lot um you know i i eventually got the 245 plate pinch but the first time i ever tried that i was like oh man i can pick a pinch dumbbell i've got this yeah. and it, it blew my mind i was like oh wow I, i'm definitely not strong in this way um but back to the question the other aspect that i would say is probably not as undertrained in climbers as thumbs, but still undertrained is wrist strength. Um, a lot of, a lot of people, and I, I, you do have to use your, your wrist, like if you're putting your hand on a sloper, you need to keep that flexion in order to, um, to keep the fingertip pressure on the top of the sloper. So that, that is an aspect where it's trained. I think physiologically, there's probably, um, people that climb are, or people that are, are more suited to climbing have um, slighter bone structures. So like smaller wrists, smaller bone structure, and that lends itself towards having weaker wrists in general. Um, so that, that's, that's another thing that, that climbers that are coming into grip need to, need to focus on generally. Okay. 
good advice. I'm sure a lot of my buddies are going to be stoked to hear that. Um, so what's your favorite brand of grippers and why? <clears throat> Ooh, that's hard. That is, that is hard. Um, well, uh, probably the first, the first thing that comes to mind is, uh, uh, Gillingham High Performance. Um, it's probably a tie between Gillingham High Performance and, um, uh, I'm drawing a blank on it. Uh, Warren Warren Tedding's grippers, the beef builders. Okay. Obviously, you can't get beef builders anymore, but like yeah. in my mind, those are like the classic. Like this, these are the serious grippers. And the knurling um, on those things is awesome. I love the knurling on the beef builders. Yeah, yeah, they're they're definitely great for um, making making attempts on you know uh, one one rep max attempts. Uh, if you use them for training, you're definitely going to eat up some, some palm skin, but yeah, I, I like those. I also like the, the Gillingham high performance grippers. I think that their, their fit and finish is really great. Um, and the knurling is sharp as hell. Uh, cause I mean, there's nothing worse than having, having your set slip in your hand whenever you're trying to do what, something that's close to your max. Only thing I don't like about the the GHBs is the little stickers on the bottoms of the handles. Um, they always end up falling off over time, but I mean they're stamped on the bottom anyway, so I guess it doesn't make that big of a difference. Okay, yeah, I haven't played with the GHBs too much yet, but I've been hearing amazing things about them, so might have to pick me up one. So, um, what are some new brands that have come out in grip sport? There's been a lot of new brands putting out uh, merchandise recently and equipment. What, uh, what are some new brands that you think are on the ball and are going to be sticking around for a while that are doing good stuff? Um, well, uh, one that people are probably more familiar with, but I, I really like what they're, what they're doing, um, is, um, Cannon Power Works. You know they've been they've been at the forefront of the gripper game for as long as I've been doing grip training, and it really seems like over the past um, year or so, uh, Matt and Christy have really um, I don't know stepped it up another notch. I think they just came out with their own line of grippers. Um, you know Matt is the go-to for getting your grippers rated, which for anybody who's listening, like you need to get your grippers rated if you're going to be serious about grippers. Like if you're just doing it as like a, a fun, fun exercise, that's fine. But the 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 spread between two different uh, two different individuals of the same gripper type can be so large, and um, you know it, you, you need to know you need to know what you're you're lifting you would never go just pick up a plate that didn't have numbers on it and put it on a bar and start lifting with it um <clears throat> but anyway so uh yeah ken and power works they've got the little thumb screw thing that you can put in the spring of the gripper and turn that to increase the resistance of the gripper like just really um neat ideas that, they, that they're coming out with as well as carrying a lot of stuff and letting you uh batch all that shipping together rather than having to you know buy a gripper here and a gripper there and a gripper there. Um, let's see, uh, Ben Sport Canada, uh, they just came out with uh, their stuff, I guess, a month or two ago. And um, I really, I really like the, the steel. It's, um, I mean, it's kind of a finicky thing, but the, I like it when the bars have like the little labels on there and you know it tells you like this is this is the name of the bar here's the dimensions here's how hard it is and then you know once you've bent it and you like set it on the shelf like you still know what it is however many down the road when you look back at it and uh they've got some cool certs and stuff and it seems like they're kind of on top of like updating things and coming up with new ideas and um so i, I like that as well and um one that's probably not as popular amongst grip sport 
uh, focused people <clears throat> is um, uh, beast fingers, hmm. beast fingers climbing. Um, they have a thing called, uh, is it called the grip pull? I think it's called the grip pull, but uh, it's not necessarily just the the tools that they're coming up with themselves, um, but these are these are basically grip training implements that are are catered more towards climbers, and um, it's it's like a disc that you can um, bolt a small hold to, and the disc has holes around it, and you can attach that to loading pins and and lift with it. Um, but uh, uh, I believe it's Amon that that, that runs it he has been putting a lot of um, like training specific uh, like measurements. So he has people lifting off of platforms with a, a load cell and um, uh, it seems like they're getting really sciencey with it, which I think is really cool. Oh, that's awesome, man. Yeah, I haven't heard of Beast Fingers yet. I'll have to check into them. That's fantastic. So, um... Do you have any new concepts or ideas, products that you are working on, a new uh, implement concept that is running through the mind right now that you can tell us about? <sighs> yeah, I mean, I, I always have, I, I have some ideas that are several years old that, um, that I'm just waiting for the opportunity to, to finish up things I've built prototypes for that, um, you know, I just had, like, I, I built a prototype, worked on it, and just haven't had time to finish the iteration to get something that I can put up on the website. Um, probably the most recent thing that I've put work into um, is a, um, basically an upgraded or advanced rating system for, for bars, for, for rating, rating nails and steel. Um, because the, um, are you familiar with the crawling, uh, the mic crawling rating system for steel? No, I have no idea how the bars are rated, honestly. Okay. So you basically take, um, you take your bar. So let's say we're doing a, a red nail and you have a, um, you have a cable clamp with, that's attached to a chain and you clamp it three quarters of an inch from the end of the bar. And then on the other end, you do the same thing. And you basically just clamp the saddle down um, so that it holds onto the bar. And then you clamp another um, like spring clip or something to the middle of the bar. Um, then you attach one end, um, the, you attach the end that has the cable clamps to a weight stack and then you pull from the middle of the bar and oh. the amount of weight that it takes to bend the bar to uh, 30 degrees, I think I'm pretty sure it's 30 degrees, that is the, that is the rating of the bar. The, the problem with this is um, you have to, like the old, the old style of doing it, I uh, imagine it's the way that almost everyone is doing it, is you, you, pull, on, you pull on the bar and we're talking, you know, 400 pounds. You lift 400 pounds and then check to see what angle the bar is. And if it's not 30 degrees yet, you add, you know, five pounds or whatever, pull it again. Add five pounds, pull it again. So by the time you've rated this bar, you've, you've and it may not be like a full range deadlift, but you've deadlifted 400 pounds for a red nail because red nails rate like between 430 and I mean, now the mutant ones that Randall's been sending out are like in the 490s. Like, you, you're like getting close to having a deadlift 500 pounds to rate these nails, which for a lot of the bigger guys and the guys who are just deadlift monsters, I'm sure that it's not a big deal to them, but I don't want to do that. Yeah, absolutely. So I... And doing it over and over again, you've weakened the bar by the time you've gotten the rating. Yeah, yeah, I'm... It, Depending on how many times you got to pull on it, fatigue can certainly uh, become an issue. And unless so, you have a perfect smooth pull every time, there's going to be an extra little bit of force on it. So, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, that's really tough. I mean, a crane system would probably be better or something. A little more science focused, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. So I, I made a thing that um, the first thing I did was I, I made a system that used a long cantilever um, that had a threaded rod in the middle of it, and then you hang a weight from the bottom. And as the uh, as the weight moves out with with this threaded rod, the cantilever um, pulls. And um, I mean, you can have a hundred pounds on this thing, and you know, since since the cantilever is fixed on one side. Mm -hmm or well hinged on one side once the weight gets all the way out here it, it ends up pulling with like 800 pounds on the bar um so i, I built that and i've used that to rate a bunch of bars i rated some for um jan heller of uh corridor bending and um well i mean honestly i've rated i've rated red nails i've rated bastards i've rated um I'm about to rate some steel for Bend, uh, Bend Sport Canada. Um, I rated some bars for the Challenge Dude, um, and it's 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 faster and certainly a lot easier than than the, the previous method, but it's still time consuming. And I I, I wanted to make something that could um, basically rate more steel faster, easier, and um, more precisely. So I've got a system that uses uh, a torque wrench and a fixture that you stick the bar in, and it determines the amount of torque that the that the steel takes to to bend. Okay. And um, uh, there's a lot of math behind it because the one of the things I wanted to do is determine. To be able to determine the rating of a piece of steel no matter what the length is because you know cutting cutting a an inch off of a red nail and making it go from seven to six inches doesn't change the nature of the nail itself it's still the same material so if i can test that material and and figure out how hard that specific steel is then you would think i should be able to do math on the back end to determine yeah. The difficulty of the different lengths of that same bar. So that's what this system does. That's cool. Yeah, absolutely. I like that. So um, let's see. So you're all around in grip. You do grip and bending and pretty much everything, and you're pretty darn elite on most things. So how do you train to stay so all around? Well, um, I'll, I'll be honest with you last last year um, the, with with all the the pan, pandemic uh, stuff going on I was um, not really focused on anything um, I just kind of did went down in the garage and did whatever I felt like doing um, but in terms of uh, shoring up my weaknesses and doing well in competitions, um, you know, I think that that has been more of a, not, I don't want to say a coincidence, but it's just, it's just kind of how it's worked out. I haven't done anything specifically uh, myself to, uh, to get that way. And I guess to be more specific, when I, when I came into training grip, I was already a elite on on um, thick bar or any kind of support thing because I because of my bouldering background and I, I will say and this is this is this is one of the best things about uh, grip sport is grip strength grip strength it sticks around um, I, I did an experiment last year and did not train for King Kong I literally did not train for King Kong um, except for uh, when the when the grab ball came in, I did one session on it, uh, like in spring, and then I did one session with the uh, two and a quarter inch crusher, and um, then I just left him alone until uh, either it was either a week or two weeks before King Kong. I did a mock meet to make sure I had my numbers right for the actual competition, yeah. <clears throat> and. Um, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't trained the flask specifically. I hadn't trained, um, 
the Little Bighorn specifically, and just from the baseline training that I had done over the years, like what I what I still had left from that, I placed seventh in the world. Wow. Um, so, like grip strength really, 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 really sticks around. Yeah. Um, that said, I mean you still need to do stuff with your hands um, to to make sure that you're not losing stuff over time. But you know, just because you say you get to where you can lift the blob and then you decide, oh, I'm not gonna, I don't want to mess with blobs. I'm gonna lift uh, anvils or something for for a long time. You focus on that, or I'm gonna focus on tearing cards or something. Like when you come back, it's not like you're gonna have uh, degenerated back to like where you you uh, never never trained the blob before. Like you could probably get back to where you were within a few weeks. Grippers are another really good example. Like I stopped training grippers for years because they weren't in the competitions I was doing. And when I came back, I was just a couple weeks off of getting back to 90, 95% of, of what I was able to do before. Um, but to, to go back to the original question, um, you know, I came in with a lot of, a lot of support strength. So there wasn't much room for me to grow there. Um, and, um, my weaknesses were primarily, uh, my thumbs. So I put in loads and loads of work on the flask, primarily training uh, pinch twice a week, um, and I would also throw in, uh, you know, wider pinch. So I have a whole blob collection downstairs and I, I was, you know, working on it pretty frequently, trying to get closer and closer to new goals with, with blobs. And um, I think the, what, what ended up happening is by spending so much time on my thumbs and the fact that, um, you know, it's, it's not easy to lose the strength that you've already built up in, with your grip, um, I was able to become pretty well-rounded. Um, but I, I, I absolutely am a, uh, a generalist, which, you know, I, I didn't really try to do that. Um, it's uh, kind of frustrating to uh, break a record and then have somebody who's like the, you know, the master at that specific thing come up and clean up behind me. Yeah, but uh, as far as as far as competitions go, though, it's great because um, my my performances I, I never have to really worry about my performance because I, I know I'm going to do well. I'm going to do well in everything. I'm I'm consistently pretty good at everything. Um, I guess the only uh, only other point for uh, behind the like well-rounded grip is I think another thing that contributes to it is having that curiosity there so you know grip is one of those great things where there's like a trillion different things to do and like they're all there's so many like cool different feats with each implement there's so many different implements um so you know unlike um unlike other other sports, you know, like baseball or something, you can, you can pitch, you can run, you can hit. I'm not a baseball person, but I'm, I can't really think of, I mean, you can catch. Yeah. But it's, it's relatively limited, the different, different things you do with, with grip strength training. I can sit here and name 150 different grip implements, and then I could name in individual feats that you can do with each of those implements. Yeah, that's one thing I've noticed uh, getting into grip that's similar to martial arts is the best guys in fighting are guys that are just creative with it. They don't lose that that childlike curiosity. They try different things. They roll with guys of different sizes and different backgrounds. They mix it up, and they become a lot better, and I've noticed in grip that's what it is. It's guys that are, I'm going to go try climbing today. I'm going to go lift, you know, hinges today, fat bars. I'm going to tear cards for a while and bend for a while. Then all of a sudden they're a monster. And yeah, I think that's, that's definitely a key factor. Absolutely. I've noticed that those creative guys are really nailing it in the grip. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, it certainly helps to, um, you know, branching out and trying different things. Um, you know, there's certain, certain, 
lifts that may not feel good for you or like the implement is like annoying to you or something but if you once you've tried enough things you can build up um a library of go-to's and kind of throw in things like oh today you know i don't really want to uh you know i don't really want to do the grab ball that much um but i still want to work my key pinch so i'm gonna break out the stub now, I'm going to be honest, I can't imagine anyone ever doing that <laughs> direction, but you get what I'm saying. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah, maybe Bloom, he'd love to break up with stuff. There's a couple guys that are really good on those little tiny implements that are amazing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, they're monsters. Yeah, it's impressive stuff. I mean, it's crazy when you try it out and you're like, oh, really? He pinched that with a penny? Okay, uh huh. <laughs> so, um, what motivates you to compete? Um, I mean, sick trophies, man. <laughs> King Kong trophies are awesome. Yeah, um, yeah. No, that's, that's, uh, that is one part of it. Um, I've been, you know, I first started, I was like, oh, I'm good at this. And like, that was the motivation. I was like, I'm good at this. Like I should, I should see how good at it I can be. Um, but then it, it, it changed over time. Like, um the the camaraderie aspect of it or um you know i had a I had a year span where um you know i wanted to i wanted to do stuff that that people couldn't really imagine was possible um but i would say i would say at this point um the competitions that i do it's it's to get people that enjoy this sport together and um you know kind of foster that competitive spirit because that's one of the things i really like about king kong is you know i have i have friends i have friends across the entire globe that you know i i can root for them and you know see them in their training and get excited and be like oh my god like um you know Jesse Pannonen's pinch this year is going to be absolutely nuts. Or like, I can't wait to see what what Tanner is going to pull on the uh, on the crusher this year. Like, yeah, I, I that's that's genuinely exciting to me, um, and and I like being part of that. Even even if like you know, in in my case, it's like wow, Gil like hit pretty solid numbers on on everything, but it wasn't really that impressive. <laughs> Yeah, it's cool to see what some of the monsters can do and their specialties, man. I and mean, it's it's amazing. You know, uh, Carl's another one. I've been watching him, and he's just oh, just a beast. Yeah. yeah, crazy numbers. So um, this is kind of a big question. It's uh, mental and physical. So what do you learn from bending? Or what do you feel like you have gotten from it? Ooh. Um. <clears throat> Well, I would say it's bending has given me um, a better insight, certainly uh, a better insight into the, I guess the delicacy, delicacy? No, delicateness of the, uh, the CNS, okay. um, you know, you're doing a lot. Your nervous system is doing a lot whenever, whenever you're bending. Um, you know, you're having to exert a lot of force. Um, you're really having to. I mean, there are some people who who can bend pretty heavy without having to psych themselves up. For me, like I, I have to like get there in my head. Um, and you're you're putting out a lot of force. It's a it's a very um, big, big grindy movement. And in addition to that, you're having to override um, your body telling you, uh, don't do this. Um, you know, your fingers hurt, you feel pressure pushing into your palms. Um, like you're, you're pushing against something that feels immovable. And, um, you know, your brain says, all right, you've, this isn't going anywhere. You've pushed it as far as it'll go, stop. And you have to keep 
keep going further and further um, until the bar starts to bend. And, um, you know, this, uh, the last 14 months or so have been really hard for a lot of people. Um, and I've, I've certainly through, um, bending noticed that my, my strength, especially, uh, highlighted when I'm bending it, my strength will wax and wane, um, with, with my, uh, my emotional state. So if, if I'm having a bad week, um, I'm not going to be setting any PRs. I may not even, I may not even get down into the gym or if I do go down there, I've had sessions where, you know, I start trying to bend and I hit, I hit a piece of steel and I'm like, man, this really hurts. And that felt really, really hard. And I'm like, I don't need to push through this. Like I I've, I've pushed through things before and, um, the, the injuries aren't worth it. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's one of the the biggest things I've I've learned. Um, you know, as far as uh, technical stuff, you know, I, I prior prior to last year, I was a I was a bending neophyte. Um, so you know, I learned all all kinds of stuff about um, how scapular flexibility is important um, in order to be able to get into position for yeah. a double overhand. Um, I'm still learning stuff about the other uh, bending styles. Uh, Sean Capusta was giving me some advice on my double underhand, which I'm just absolutely terrible at. So, um, yeah, man, it's it's another one of those things. Uh, bending is is just like grip. There's a billion different types of uh, types of metal that you can bend that have different properties, different form factors. You got you got um, hex and square. Uh, round, you got different sizes, you got brace bending, unbrace bending, horseshoes, long bar, mid bar, short steel. I mean, it's, there's, there's so much information to take in. Yeah, absolutely. The square was kind of neat the first time I tried that. That's a little bit different. It stopped me in my tracks the first time I tried it. I had to figure out how to get that sucker in the good position. Yeah, that was, yeah. That was neat. And yeah, about the flexibility on the double over, man, that is, it's crazy how much of a difference in power you get when you find that right position, when you find that groove. It's amazing. Yeah, I, and to that, um, I, uh, you know, I, I wanted to uh, bend an ADD nail. I think that, I think that was one of my driving, uh, the driving forces behind this. And I, um, you know, I've got a workshop so I can cut stuff to whatever length I want to. And I bought, uh, bought a, a bunch of five sixteenths and I cut some to seven. I cut some to seven and a quarter, seven and a half, seven and three quarters, eight and, and so on. Um, I think all the way up to eight and a half. And I think I had 20 bars of each and I bent through all of it. And one thing I noticed um, was by the time I got to the eight, eight and a half bars, I mean, it's hard to get out there. I understand yeah. why, why the gold nail, nobody's, nobody's asserted on it yet. It's, I mean, that requires just a tremendous amount of flexibility to be able to get something like that in position for double overhand. Um, but what I noticed is once I was able to um, bend an eight and a half piece of five sixteenths, which isn't really that difficult to bend, but getting it in position um, does require that flexibility. When I came back to seven inches, it was like nothing. It just, like, just popped it under there and just eat it up. And, um, you know, That's I, why I felt just going from seven to six inches. Yeah. Yeah. Six inches used to be like, that was, that was comfortable for me. Yeah, seven inches, I was just like, who, who, why is this the length that people are wanting to bend? But um, yeah, uh, I think it was Tom Tom Flesher uh, on on the Beyond the Bend podcast was talking about uh, using acetyl rods. I think Devin Hoover now um, sells those uh, with his bending starter kits. But you take a, an acetyl rod that is a certain length and just kind of practice your kink on that. Yeah. And uh, he was working on longer ones and. Um, yeah. That's another way to do the same thing without having to cut 200 pieces of steel. Yeah, I've been doing that with the polycarbonate rods and 
Yeah, yeah. It absolutely helps get in the groove. I feel like when the gold nail goes down, it's going to be a tall guy that does it, honestly, because just the breadth and being able to get in that position with the extra height, they'll probably just be able to make it happen. I mean, for them, it's, you know, comparative size-wise. So it's just my opinion is it'll be a taller guy that does it first. But we'll see. So uh, what environment do you think is best for bending? Where do you like to bend the best? Um... Well, I do, I do most of my bending um, just down in my garage. Um, I, I don't have the benefit of having um, a lot of uh, training partners for, for grip strength and, and bending related training. So I train by myself, um, well, with my dogs. Um, uh, I guess lately, um, I record my PR bends and um, I know I'll get a, a copyright claim if I have music playing in the background. Yeah. And, I and granted, I guess I probably shouldn't care um, because the, the video is for me. It's not, it's not really for anybody else. Um, but I, I get really annoyed with copyright claims. I always go in and dispute them. And I'm just like, this music was in the background. Nobody's going to watch this video so they can listen to the song. To listen to the song. Yeah. But um uh, my ideal, I think my ideal environment would be, um, you know, playing, you know, whatever, whatever, uh, heavy song I want to listen to. And, uh, honestly, when it's sunny out, I'll walk out and stand in the sun. Just, I, I like to feel the, the sun, like warming up my skin and, um, and, you know, just bend out on the driveway. Nice. Absolutely. Um, so describe a time you got really nervous before a bend or during a bend. Ooh, I mean, honestly, the most, uh, the, there's the two, two bends that I've been the most nervous about. Um, one was a quarter inch 12.9 bolt. Um, so monster bolt. yeah, it was, but it, it, it's, you know, just a, extra extra grade eight essentially and i went to bend the first one i ever bent i snapped the threads off of it and um that scared the hell out of me so the second time i bent one i was like why am i doing this why am i doing this and i ended up taking uh an old leather um bending pad and like tucking it down into the collar of my shirt yeah. to, and putting a rubber band it's around my neck. Man. Yeah, I was making a gorget and, and I bent it. it. That one didn't snap. I think I, I put the wraps like a little bit further on it so that it um, it wasn't so much pressure directly on the threads. But yeah, during that, I was really nervous about it. And then I had a, I had a, uh, an edging that I was bending and I got it to probably... Um, I don't know, 20, 25 degrees or so. And um, I took a look at the threads and the threads, like they were bent significantly more than the, um, than the bolt itself, the shaft of the bolt itself was. And then I like got it up under the light and was looking real close and I was like, oh man, is that a crack in the threads? Is that about to break off? And I, I knew that um, some bolts from that same same batch. These weren't anybody's bolts they were selling. They were some from, I think, McMaster Car. Um, but yeah, I was like, screw that. I'm not, I'm not popping an edge in and punching myself and maybe stabbing myself. So I, I, that bolt is never getting bent. Yeah. That's crazy, man. I haven't had one snap yet, but man, that's, uh, that's a scary thought. Just the whole idea. I've seen some snap and have shards hanging off some square and that just looks gnarly yeah some square can can be dangerous too for sure um i think i think probably the so the reason that the the reason that the bolts are snapping at the threads is where they cut that material off to make the thread or roll the threads onto the bolt however they manufacture it the diameter the diameter of the bolt is smallest there in addition to that little v that's created 
um, by the, 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 the peaks and the valleys of the thread, that's a stress, that's a stress uh, concentration point. So, um, you know, it, it really just depends on how small that diameter is inside that, that valley of that thread, whether it'll, whether it'll break there or not. Um, so the one thing that I've, I've said is if you're going to order, if you're going to order some bolts and you want to like reduce the chance of them, uh, snapping at the threads, um, order them with fine threads because the, their fine threads aren't as deep as coarse threads. Okay. The, other thing, the other thing you can do if you have like a cutoff saw or a band saw or some, some way to, I mean, I guess a, a bolt cutter would work just as well too. Um, you can just buy bolts that are longer than what you need and, and just cut off the threaded portion. Yeah, that's what I was thinking you could just do is just buy them an inch longer, cut off the threaded portion and a hacksaw will take care of that. Yeah. yeah. Real quick. So um, what's your greatest athletic achievement? Um, wow, uh, probably, um, as far as greatest overall, um, would probably be my, my, uh, King Kong, uh, overall win in, um, in, uh, 2016, I think it was, um, it, it would be either that because I mean that was that was 200 something competitors across the world and and you know included um, a lot of the the strongest grip competitors that that were competing at that time for sure what weight class were you that year uh, 93 kilogram that's tough class yeah yeah um, it kind of goes back and forth because there was one year where uh, everybody that I was worried about moved up a class, and I was like, "All right, guys." But um, yeah, so the placing placing first out of out of two hundred people um, that year was was pretty awesome. Then there was the South Jersey Four competition um, that I, I went to. I think that was the same year, um, but that was uh, put on by Nate Bruce and. Um, in, in Jersey and that there was like 50 people there and I think at that point that was the largest single venue competition held in the United States and maybe the world um, for, for grip strength and um, it was it was uh, flat it was um, was it 30 millimeter block set grippers I think it was 30 millimeter block set wow. grippers and then um flask and uh two and a half inch crusher and um i was able to really i mean i, I, I put down a pretty good performance on on just about everything um for for me and uh i won that one overall and by body weight so we yeah. had uh, we used the uh, allometric scaling um which the big guys complained about a whole lot, but <laughs> um, I, I won based on the allometric scaling, but I also won overall. Yeah. So, um, and considering some of the people I was competing against, um, I was I was really pleased with that. Yeah, that's awesome. I was in a contest that did that recently, and uh, there was a guy that was over three hundred pounds. So unless he got world records in some of his lifts, he had pretty much no chance. Yeah, I think in general having weight classes makes the most sense um, because you know when you when you start looking at when you start looking at um, weight, you, there's so many other things that are in there like height and just different um, physical morphologies that that um, make a really big difference. You know, somebody that's oh yeah, I'm learning all about that right now. I was just talking to Jed about that just uh, yesterday. I'm five foot nine. And my hands are just shy of seven and a half inches. So I'm looking at, by October, trying to be in the 83 class and seeing how I feel there. Yeah, yeah. When, when you, once you get into the, like, 
93 and especially the 105 and 120 classes like there's going to be there's going to be guys with like nine inch hands yeah and like well, what are you gonna there, do there are untrained people with hands that big that can pull like absolutely disgusting numbers on on rolling handles oh yeah absolutely i've seen guys untrained get air under a blob because they have you know almost nine inch hands eight and three quarter inch hands these long banana fingers (laughs) (laughs) it's crazy but yeah so that's that's something i'm going to be working on for a bit yeah it's, it's interesting to think about how hand size isn't really factored into the scoring with grip sport yet yeah that's that's one of the challenges i think that that promoters have in in structuring a a good competition um you know i because that's the other thing is even even when you introduce weight classes there are the like rock climbers for example you take you take tanner he competed several years in the 83 kilogram class and he's got very big hands, and he is, he, he like, started out elite, like, super world-class elite at, at rolling handles. I mean, he's, like, arguably the best in the world now, but, like, when, when he just started and was 83 kilograms, he was still unfreaking believable at it. Yeah. Um, I think, personally, um, you know, in, in structuring – in structuring contests, um, I think the best way to do it is uh, lean more towards events that are uh, not quite as um, not quite as hand size uh, dependent. So, if you want to do a support lift, um, something like a tips tester, or um, I mean, even the grab ball, honestly. Um, something like that that's still testing your your support strength um, but doesn't overwhelmingly favor somebody with just gigantic mitts and then of course um, you know if you're using uh, a medium to small pinch implement um, that that doesn't uh, favor people with enormous hands or if um, uh, what's the hubs that's another one that that people with small hands can still be extremely good at look at look at jerome bloom he's one of the the strongest hub lifters on the planet yeah. um, so i think if if getting um the most people into the sport and not only that but like determining who actually has the strongest hands because there's a there's a difference between strongest and biggest hands like if you want to know who can generate the most force through their hands then i think event selection is is important and um that's definitely a challenge that uh by and large the sport has yet to meet for sure absolutely yeah when i when we uh conceptualize the potato which actually just grew so when it grew though it grew in favor of people that had smaller hands so we, we kind of that was a consideration that was made by the, the you know grip gods or whatever so yeah that's definitely a, a factor that you know giant handed people though they trouble they struggle with some things in grip too so it's kind of interesting to see that you know yeah i think that some of the giant handed people could do well on certain things but then they hold a gripper and they can't even put it in their hand right so So, um, what's your greatest blunder or injury? Ooh, um, my greatest, oh man, yeah, my greatest blunder, my greatest injury is, is, um, my herniating my, my L5S1, uh, disc, um, but that that was more of like a, a chronic injury um, that was kind of interspersed with acute acute steps of injury, and you know that has that has affected my life negatively. Um, you know to this to this day, like um, you know I, I can do most of the stuff that I want to do. Am I ever going to pull a six hundred pound deadlift? Not likely. Um, but in terms of Blunders, um, there is one that 
I'm definitely never going to forget. And it was uh, one of the years that I posted the um, uh, uh, grip uh, grip nationals, and grip nationals is, is structured with um, grippers first, then uh, pinch, then thick bar, then medley. And I mean, it may be, I think it's different now. They, uh, it's changed, it's changed a lot since I, since I last competed in it. But, um, so we get set up for grippers and, um, I go to, I'm, I'm trying to like game, I'm trying to game the, the structure of the, the event. So, um, grippers is one of the only events that's not rising bar. So you can start wherever you want and move around, okay. um, relative to that and I in my training I knew I was like real close to being able to close up you think you're like a 180 or a 185 gripper I think I think I was I think before that I had closed like a 184 and I was like all right it's competition day I've had my cups of coffee I'm hyped up let's destroy this 185 and I go to hit it and it shuts me down and I'm like, whoa, wasn't even close on that. All right, well, I'll definitely be able to get a uh, 175. So I stepped back down a little bit. And like 175, not a problem for me in training. So I go to close it, shuts me down again. I'm like, oh, no. Like, I need to, like, I need to do this. So I go uh, for 165, and I miss that. I end up bombing out on on grippers. Like um, we were doing, we were doing both hands, but like I, I zeroed on on my left. I think it was my right hand grippers. Um, a little bit of background. There's a set of grippers that they use for nationals, and um, it's just like I think they're in increments of five like all the way from like 20 all the way up to 220 or something like that. So I had these grippers uh, shipped to me and I think I'd had them for a year and I, I never took them out of the box. I just left them in and I was like, man, that'd be, that'd be really lame if I was, you know, training or using these grippers that are for this competition and like knew how each of them felt and yeah. everything. So I just left them in the box, never touched them. Brought them to the competition and I guess just from the moisture in my garage, the, the springs had like seized a little bit. So I think for that specific competition, the ratings on everything were like maybe like five higher or 10 higher. Cause like everything felt really, really stiff. Everybody, like there were a lot of people that were having trouble and like feeling like what, what's going on with this? This is not, this is not 150 or this is not 120. So on top of that, I think, the shock to my like psyche from missing like not one but two in a row like shut me down for uh the the last attempts and um yeah I ended up I, I bombed on that I still uh I was gonna I was gonna just stop competing after that and just focus on on running the competition I was like I mean if I'm not gonna like be able to put up a good score like I might as well just focus but everybody was like no 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 you have to like lift and uh I mean it's good I, I PR'd on on the two other lifts oh, that's um, good. yeah uh, I was I was actually really really pleased with my uh with my flask and I think I pulled I think I pulled a record on the um yeah I think I broke a record on the axle and then uh Eric Rusain was came up behind me and then like rebroke the record or I think that's what happened but um yeah if I had not bombed on that gripper um I would have I would have placed first in in nationals um which you know still regret to this day but I will say uh that was um one of my first first opportunities to watch Tanner Merkel just absolutely murder a competition like the reason i would have beat him is because i was i was at the time um better at deadlifting than him and he was having trouble lifting like his back could not lift as much as his hands so um Actually where i'm at right now 
yeah, it's, I, I've, I've never quite been there. Um, I imagine it's really frustrating. Um, but yeah, it, it, at the, that was like the last time that I would have been able to beat Tanner. Um, and I would have, I would have won nationals that year, but I, I botched, I botched the, the, uh, first gripper attempt. Yeah. Moral of the story, I guess, is oil your grippers, take care of those things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and you know, you got to balance your risk versus reward. Like what I was trying to do is hit my top gripper attempt first and then just say no to the rest of them and save my energy, which if it works, that technique is great. If it doesn't work, you're really setting yourself up for trouble on your remainder of your attempts. Yeah, for sure. That's a pretty crazy, bold strategy. But yeah, I'd imagine you do that and you save all your energy. That's huge. So what's uh, what's your big goal now? Um, well, as far as bending goes, um, you know, I, I bent my first edge in a few months ago. Um, my wrist is kind of bothering me now. So it's been a few months since I've had any other PRs. But um, I really want to... Um, I really want to bend the uh, Horido 8.8 bolt. Okay. Um, I think that I was, I think that I was pretty close to being able to do that, um, based on the ratings that I had on the the edging that I bent and the ones and the ratings that I've I've done for his bolts. Um, I just need to be able to do it in under five minutes. The the one that I bent was like six, so I just need to be a little bit faster. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to try to get back to be able to do that. Um, in terms of grip strength, um, uh, uh, Carl August Mertz, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. Um, he's cams on, uh, on Instagram, but he's, he's got an advanced, um, crush to dust challenge that he created. Oh, really? And That's cool. You... You deadlift, you deadlift um, two inch dumbbells, then you hub lift two um, shallow dish forty uh, fives, and then Crazy. you you uh, uh, no set two number threes. Okay. And I have done all of those feats individually, but trying to do all of them. Um, consecutively is very difficult that's quite a challenge man that's awesome i hadn't heard yeah. of that one yet that is nuts uh to me to me that's like the most impressive impressive spread of of feats that i've ever seen yeah absolutely i can only think of a handful of guys that can accomplish that you know i'm going through the list right now in my head i'm like oh that's about like you know a dozen guys maybe that's pretty fantastic how many guys have done that so far? One. It's just Carl. Just Carl? Yeah. Okay. So it's pretty that's, neat. That's the, it's, that's the problem is it, it requires a, a generalist and not, not only a generalist, but like an extremely high level generalist. Like it, yeah. like you can't, you can't just be good at all three of those things. You have to be good at all three of those things with both hands. Yep. And like no setting in one day. Yeah. That's crazy. Um, no setting two number threes is, is just like, for me, that's the hardest, that's the hardest one because it requires, it requires a lot of dexterity to get the grippers in place in your hands. Yeah. And, and like, I mean, no setting number three is just hard. So, um, but yeah, like the, like a lot of people that are good at grippers and, and dumbbells, uh, or thick. Uh, thick bar like they're not very good at hubs or somebody might be really good at grippers and hubs but like deadlifting those big ass dumbbells is a lot I mean that's that's a that's a 344 pound yeah. uh, deadlift it's a lot yeah on fat bar that's insane yeah, that's a pretty intense feat, man. Yeah, it's you can go through some of the legends and think, well, wait, could they could they do this part of it? Yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, that's huge. I hope you get that. That's a big one. 
So um, what are some lifestyle habits that you subscribe to that benefit the average person trying to get fit? Say it one more time. What are some lifestyle habits that you subscribe to that have helped you or that would help the average person get fit? Um, honestly, the biggest, the biggest thing for me is, uh, is sleep. I feel like sleep is one of the most under, under emphasized things, uh, especially in fitness culture. You have people that are like, yeah, well, you use this, use this, uh, pre-workout. It'll get you really going and like hustle, hustle, hustle. And like, I wake up at 4.00 AM just, and I start working out or I'm like working out after everybody else gets off work and is watching TV, I'm working out. And it's like, well, yeah, but like, when, when is your body recovering? Yeah. Like when, when are you recovering? And I know like, especially people that are selling supplements or a lot of people that are, you know, got 20,000 followers on Instagram, like they may have other things that are helping them recover. Um, but for a normal human being, like you need sleep yeah. and most people like, I don't think that there actually are people out there that can get by with only five or six hours of sleep. They're just shortchanging themselves. Like you may not, you may not like pass out in your car or like, you know, get a headache or whatever, but you are shortchanging your body by not letting it rest. Um, let's see, as far as other things, um, you know, I try to do, I try to do a lot of uh, like a lot of warming up and a lot of prehab before I get into my stuff. Um, and that's learned from experience and I learned it the hard way. Um, especially like when I started rock climbing, I would walk in the gym, throw down my bag, grab my shoes and my chalk pot and just like, go start working on whatever project I, I had done last time and like you know that's not good I mean you can get away with it whenever you're 18 can't get away with it whenever you're 34 yeah so um you know now when I go to the go to the gym I um every single time I, I have like a, a a back prehab that I do um, if I'm doing anything that's going to require a lot of shoulders, like anything overhead or, or bending or climbing, anything like that, I do shoulder prehab. Yeah. Um, and then I start with really, really easy stuff and um, just kind of feel it and, and see um, when I think I'm warm enough and, and loose enough to be able to, to do the thing that I'm, the hard stuff that I'm, that I'm looking to do. Um, so what unconventional training methods have you stumbled upon that have helped your performance significantly over a conventional method? Hmm. Okay. Um, so in terms of competition, um, and this is, this is actually, this relates back to the generalist question. So, um, one of the things that's helped me the most in, in prep for competitions is having my hands close enough to each other in strength that I have options when it comes to like what I'm gonna do on, on comp day. And what I mean by that is, um, and this, this happens occasionally, like the perfect, uh, the perfect setup for a King Kong, for example, you've got four events total. Um, you know, I pick two that are good for my right hand and two that are good for my left. So I'll, I'll train, I'll train up to eight weeks before the competition with both hands, um, trying to get strong on everything with both hands. But after that, when I'm like eight weeks out, I'm only training the hand that is going to be using that implement on that implement. I'm not I'm not wasting time using the other hand and being being that balanced um that allows me to basically have the amount of uh stress that i'm putting my hands under and i can i can pack i can either just you know have half as much stress or i can pack in double the volume and get a lot more training in there 
and the fact that my hands are still pretty close even after that that eight week block um you know if something happens i tear my hand open um i'm not i'm not in in any kind of trouble because i can I, I'll, I'll take a hit but i can still lift with the other hand okay do you think that balance comes from a foundation of climbing is there a um, correlation there you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised, honestly, because, um, you know, the, the bouldering problems and, and climbing routes, they, they don't really follow any sort of set pattern that would uh, make you biased towards one hand or the other. Um, you know, there's certain things you can do, uh, there's certain things you can do that you get to choose which hand you're, you're using. Like if you're playing dodgeball, like I'm gonna throw it with my arm, my throwing arm, right? Um, and even if you're like catching or or whatever, like generally you can, you can bias towards that side. But if I'm rock climbing and the hold is by my left hand, I'm not gonna take my right hand because it's, you know, 10 or 15% stronger and reach all the way across my body. Like I'm going to use the hand that's closest to it, um, so I, I do think that it, it uh, tends to balance you more in that way versus um, other other things. You know, people uh, generally have a hand that they like to use for things, and 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 that's going to create a strength imbalance over time. For sure, yeah, I figured that that definitely uh, benefited. You know, I mean, how could it not? So. Um, if you could start your training over again today with what you know now, what would you do different and why? Hmm. Well, going all the way back to the rock climbing days, um, I would, I would probably have a strength program because at the time I just rock climbed six days a week and then played dodgeball on, on the seventh day, um, which just absolutely ate up my elbows and shoulders. Um, so having having like a dedicated like strength and mobility practice, I think would have would have uh, helped me, not necessarily um, like prevented injuries because I actually didn't get injured that much climbing despite training like an idiot. Um, but it, I think it would have helped me progress further um, and get stronger. Um, just allowing recovery and like working on other stuff. Um, I think I also uh, would have would have focused more on um, core strengthening exercises. Like I said, I, I, I uh, had surgery two years ago for uh, a herniated disc, and um, I know that generally most of us don't like doing uh, core exercises are not they're not really the the most fun exercises but they they really are important and almost everyone uh could stand to do more of them so you know i would have done more uh bird dogs and dead bugs and planks and turkish get-ups yeah. things like that and you know from my powerlifting days like i wish i would have uh taking kettlebells a little more seriously because I mean, now I really like kettlebells. I, I like doing swings. I like, I like kettlebell snatches, love Turkish get-ups. And I think all those things would have benefited my, uh, benefited my, my strength practice back then. And I guess the, the general takeaway from everything that I'm saying now is, you know, I, not that I had the money to do it necessarily, um, but I think I would have benefited from having either a like a, a coach or a strength mentor, but somebody who um, wasn't necessarily just like a strong person that had opinions about strength, but an educated person who had ex experience uh, training people and and dealing with injuries and um you know building building stronger athletes yeah for sure getting a coach is invaluable I and mean, it's huge i 100 percent have to agree on that point so um what's your most important piece of equipment you have at home and why Ooh, 
Um, that's a tough one. Uh, I mean, it, it depends on it depends on the time. Most of my like most important equipment is is uh, dependent on what I what I need at a specific time. So like right now, um, I'm using the hell out of my hot tub. Uh, like every every day, I go in the hot tub and I do uh, wrist controlled articular rotations, mm -hmm. and um, that's that's helping this uh, nagging wrist injury heal, which has been kind of sidelining me from my double overhand bending for a while. It also helps my, my back. Um, prior to that, I had um, another wrist injury. Hey, if in case you haven't caught it yet, I don't have good wrists. Yeah. Um, I had a serious, I want to I want to say it was probably carpal tunnel, um, but I had like serious problems with my wrists from pressing. Um, I, I've been trying to get a big bench and um, just all that compression uh, made it so that when I went to sleep, my fingers and thumb would uh, would go numb. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'd, I'd wake up in the middle of the night and it would just be like buzzing, like pins and needles. Yeah, I got that when I first started getting into bending a lot. I'd wake up with that, and I started using doing a lot of Tai Chi bong work. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, um, I've got the. I started with sledgehammers, and then I, I, I developed the the wrist. Mace. Yeah, so the rubber flex bar things. Those are pretty good for wrist recovery. Those are huge. Yeah, I really like those. Yeah, yeah. So. Basically, working working wrist stuff into um, into my my workouts. That that basically, you know, I I, I don't believe in in uh, you know a, a panacea or anything, but like it really it really reversed that pain. I haven't really had much issue with with um, that kind of compression since I started using the uh, the wrist mace. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I did the hammer rotations as well. Yeah, I noticed that right when I got into bending, I woke up and I was like, what the heck is going on? Yeah, it's, it's that crazy pressure. It's, it's, it's crazy. I mean, and then when I first got back into grippers, there would be sometimes I'd wake up at night and I'd be clenching my hand and I'd be like, what, what is going on here? <laughs> so I guess you got to work the extensioners. You got to do the recovery work to help them calm down before you go to sleep. That's for sure. Yeah. So um, do you have any other advice for people that are trying to get fit at home? Um, getting fit at home or just staying healthy. Any advice for the fans out there? Uh, yeah, yeah. Honestly, um, I think one of the best things that you can do, and this is this is not sexy. Um, it, it sounds like old people advice, but like, don't don't spend a lot of time sitting down. Yeah. Um, like. And I, I, I hear it go back and forth about whether like sitting is the, is the new smoking or whatever, but like really like don't spend a whole lot of time sitting down. Um, if you can get a standing, like everybody's working from home now, um, or a lot of people are like, if you, if you are doing that and it's going to be, and it's going to be um, a more permanent fixture for you, get a standing desk um, or a, arrange it in a way that you can stand while you're working. Um, watching, watching TV and stuff is fine, but if like, say you drive for a living, like give yourself every, every hour or so, give yourself like five or 10 minutes to like, you know, walk around and, and, and stretch out because, um, you know, it's everything I've read, everything I've listened to points towards sitting being just not, not good for you. So, you know, yeah. get out walk your dog if you've got one or just walk around your neighborhood um stand whenever you're doing doing calls um so uh, yeah walking walking in in and standing are two of the biggest things um and i know i i'm very privileged in that i i owned a gym for a while and already had a home gym and had a bunch of grip equipment prior to the pandemic but i know that the the price of of um, weights and, and equipment has just gone through the roof and um, for people that want to 
um, get into uh, uh, weighted, like doing doing a strength practice with weights. Um, man, it's hard to beat kettlebells. Yeah. Honestly, like yeah, you, like a kettlebell is is expensive um, to buy one of them, but you don't you don't need like a whole set of them. Um, I could do, I could do. I would say a good 50 to 60% of my general strength stuff that I want to do. Um, I could do that with one 24 kilogram kettlebell yeah. and I, and I could, I could be strong. I could stay strong and, and stay, stay fit and, um, and just have that one thing. Absolutely. I mean, just for quality of life strength, just strength to traverse through the world easily. Yeah, that one thing would do 100% of what you need. And I mean, not even looking at the science, you know, of sitting versus smoking or whatever, just taking a cursory look at cultures where they don't sit as much as the American culture, you find that their, their medical bills are significantly cheaper in their older age. There are a lot less people dealing with adversity. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So um, do you have any questions for us, Couch Potato Strong, before I let you go? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, what, um, what would you like to see uh, different about uh, grip strength, grip strength equipment and competitions and... Um, and maybe even beyond that, just the strength world in general. Um, well, we talked a little bit about uh, grip strength evolving um, to where they could score it a little better and things like that. But I think that where grip strength needs to go in order to expand to a, a wider audience is I honestly think it needs to go a little less aggressive um, in some means, um, some things that are more easily approachable because grip stuff is all very hard metal and scary and like, you know, kind of intimidating to just someone that's entering a gym. So if we wanted to expand it to clients that are just entering a gym or just trying to use grip for quality of life, then we need to make it so it can target those people. The baby boomers is a huge demographic. And the fact that grip sport isn't targeting them specifically or that grip companies aren't targeting them is insane. I mean, that's the biggest demographic that's out there just about. So why aren't we telling them that if they do this stuff, they can open jars and they won't have to worry about opening their bottles and they won't have to worry about getting around easily in life. Like that's to me, that's crazy that that grip sport isn't, hasn't breached the, or hasn't crossed the bridge to quality of life. So I'd like to see that happen. Um, I think the other thing that's happening that's already taking place and some guys are talking about it, Jed and Adam Glass are focused on it a little bit is a sport specific grip. Um, we're seeing a little more sport-specific grip, and I think that was, was going to happen anyways. But I think that that, you know, seeing grip in locker rooms, like guys talking about grip that are football players and guys talking about grip-specific levering that are baseball players, I think we'll see that in the next 20 to 30 years. But I definitely think it needs to be expanded to people that aren't hardcore athletes because I feel like the five golden principles that you must train if you're not – um, competing and you just want to get through life well, as you mentioned, core. I think core is huge. You got to take care of your neck, your mouth, your hands, and your feet because those things don't get trained in day to day life. Your arms, your chest, your back, all that stuff. You know, typically, if you're a fairly active person moving around, you're training those things in some way enough to where they'll be strong enough to get you through life. The other five things, not so much. So that's kind of yeah. where I want to see it going. Um, cause I do self-defense training, but I also do Tai Chi for the elderly. So I focus a lot on how we can uh, improve quality of life for people. Awesome. That's, uh, no, I, I agree with you on the, the importance of those things. And, um, that's, that's, that's certainly one of the things that I would like to see as well. Um, you know, not only making the competitions a better representation of, of strength, but also, making making the the sport reach out to more more demographics um because i mean not only is it important for people to train but it's it's fun it's fun like it shouldn't yeah. be relegated to just a, a few people's garages 
Like it should be, it should be something that's as common as, you know, uh, playing playing frisbee or something like that. It should be, it shouldn't be uh, uh, a secret, a secret art, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. It's time of, of people making money off of doing some of these feats is pretty much over, and there's no reason to keep those secrets, you know, guarded anymore. I, I don't really see that. So, yeah, absolutely. I say share the knowledge and get everybody excited about it. That's part of what you know. We're stoked that so many kids are playing with our golden potato tool, and we're gonna have you know legends and women's and masters and childrens at our uh, at our events. So we're just excited that more people are getting into it. And um, the original idea behind the potato was it would appeal to obstacle course racers and climbers as well as grip guys because it's, you know, it's a rock kind of thing. So we just thought we'd bridge the whole gap there. And then the strong men who love natural stones, you know, find it a puzzle to figure out how to hold it in their hand, right? So that's pretty cool too. Awesome. So yeah, just bringing people together, getting more people excited about grip and health. That's kind of what we hope the future holds. I'm glad to see y'all doing that work. And I hope that that I'm able to to contribute to that as well. Awesome. Look forward to seeing what you pull in the potato. Any uh, specific uh, feats that you're going for? You'd probably be good at the pull-ups. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, I did I did see the uh, was it was it Cody that did uh, uh, pull-ups on the potato. Cody's at 13 reps. The record's 16 by a uh, Hawaiian climber, Kapu. Ooh. And Jason Dingy pulled off a pull-up, and he weighs 334 pounds. Man, that guy's a machine. So, yeah, the weighted pull-up record is, I don't know, almost untouchable at this point. Um, I do like doing pull-ups. I'm, uh, I will say, uh, even even though I'm I'm a bit on the heavier side for a climber, um, especially when it comes to thumbs, I can still I can still put down some put down some power on on uh, pulling up on a hold. So, nice. I think I may go for that. Awesome. Well, we look forward to it. All righty. Well, thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. It's been great talking to you. All right. Enjoy the rest of your day. You too.